member for Vancouver East. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. I'll be splitting my time with the member from New Westminster, Burnaby. Um, uh, Madam Speaker, today we're talking about an NDP motion, um, uh, something that we've been pushing for for a very long time now, and that is for the government to act on bringing a universal, comprehensive, single-payer pharmacare system to Canadians. This has been a long-time dream of the NDPs. In fact, 53 years ago, Tommy Douglas brought to us Medicare. This is what Canadians itemize as, the, some, as one of the single proudest moment in our Canadian history. To ensure that Canadians can see the doctors and get the medical services that they need. Unlike south of the border, where in the United States, people literally cannot access the medical attention that they need and people die from that situation. We are the envy of the universe. But to complete that dream of Tommy Doug Douglas, it has always been the CCF NDP's vision to bring in a comprehensive, universal, single-payer pharmacare program. Now, we know that the Liberals have said that they support this and have said this for a very long time. In fact, to be more precise, for exactly 23 years, they said that they would support it. Now we are in a situation of a minority government situation. So let's hope, and I hope, with all of my heart that we will, in fact, coming out of this par parliament, implement a universal, single-payer, comprehensive pharma care system. That is what our motion is pushing for. That's what we, what we want to see. And I believe that's what Canadians want to see. And in fact, out of the government's own consultative process with their own council, the Hoskins report came out to say unequivocally with 60 recommendations laying out a, dis a, a, a concise plan of how this could be achieved. And in their report, they highlight a number of things that I think is warrant attention in this House. And, Madam Speaker, just so we know, some 7.5 million Canadians do not have adequate prescription coverage. So that is to say some 7.5 million Canadians cannot get the medication that they need. And 16% of the people in Canada went without medication for heart disease, for cholesterol or hypertension because of cost. And Madam Speaker, the amount of prescription drug spending paid out of pocket in Canada in 2016 is $7.6 billion. That's a lot of money coming out of the pockets of everyday Canadians, money that they could otherwise use to support their family if there was a universal pharmacare program, Madam Speaker. The government talks all the time about how they want to support middle class Canadians, well, implement universal pharmacare. That would support every single Canadian, including the middle class Canadians as well. Madam Speaker, and the people who often get hit hard and perhaps the hardest because they can't access a pharmacare program, actually, women get impacted. Fewer women have employer health benefits, Madam Speaker, compared to men. And women are more likely to report non-compliance to their prescription medication because of costs. Not because they don't want to, but because they can afford it. And cost-related non-compliance is a common problem amongst the Indigenous community as well. Those between 18 to 44 years old, people with lower health status and people with lower incomes, often can access the medication that they need because they can't afford it. So, Madam Speaker, there is no question in my mind that it is time to act. Now, I know some will say that we can't proceed with this. Why? Because the provinces and territories say they don't want to. Well, one of the issues that they have tabled and put on the record is, in fact, they need the government to ensure that the health transfer payments are kept up. If the Liberals actually wanted to do something about this and ensure the negotiations go well with provinces and territories, it's for them to ensure the medical, the health transfer payments are actually provided for. 
instead of adopting the conservative Harper cuts to the health transfer, transfer payments, the government could say, no, we're not going to take that path. We're not going to go down the path of the Harper Conservatives. And in fact, we will fully fulfill our requirements and responsibility in the health care transfer payments. And when you do that, I would fully expect that the provinces and territories will come to the table and earnestly negotiate with the Canadian government to put in place a universal, comprehensive, single-payer a pharmacare program. Madam Speaker, let me share a story with you. I, during the campaign, like everyone else in this House, went door knocking and I visited a constituent. And I have to tell you, it shook me to this day. And here's his story. He is a senior who just recently retired, worked hard all of his life, paid his taxes and did all of those things. And of course, as he aged, he had gotten ill. He has a number of complicated health conditions. His medication costs him about $1,000 a month. And that's a lot of money for an income of a senior on a fixed income. And that senior told me that he has some savings, that he has savings that he could pay for this medication for a few months. But of course, his savings will run out. And then what to do? I think he said to me that his savings will run out, in fact, by this summer. And he was very worried about what's going to happen when that, when that occurs, because he would not be able to get the life-saving medication that he needs. And he said to me, you have to go and fight for a universal farmer care program, not just for me, but for my friends and other people like me. And you know, Madam Speaker, I took his words to heart. And here we are in this debate. And I asked the government to, yes, support this motion, and then also to get on with it and to actually fully realize this motion and put it into reality. No more excuses. No more delays. No more this, I can't do that. And no more saying that we support it and then decades later, we're still talking about it. I don't want to come back to this House to have to debate this once again. Because what I want to see, and I think what Canadians want to see, is for this program to be in, in, in place. This program will save lives. We know that. And more importantly, or perhaps not more importantly, equally important for those people who talk about money, that this program will save money as well. How often do you get to do this? You can have the cake and eat it too. This is the kind of program that we're talking about. And we are in a minority government situation and it can become reality. How about we fulfill, fulfill that dream? How about we end that notion that Canada is the only country in the world that has a universal Medicare program without pharmacare. How about we put that to bed once and for all, forever, by implementing universal pharmacare? The government says that they want to act, but we don't, I don't want to hear these, act, these words just in words anymore. I want to see this action in the budget, in the upcoming 2020 budget, for the government to allocate resources to get this done. The Hoskins report, which I read through from page to page last night, so that I get the full scope of what the recommendations are, 60 recommendations, and they outline very clearly, step by step, of how you can get this done and where the savings are, Madam Speaker. And so the government cannot have that excuse to say that they don't have a blueprint. They actually had this work done. The council did this work. Dr. Hoskin and the team went out there and did this work, and they lay out in detail in the report, step by step, of how this could be done. So no more excuses, Madam Speaker. The constituent that I met during the campaign is in desperate need for the government to act. People in our community are in desperate need for the government to act. And for members of parliament, and especially on the liberal side, this is your moment. This is our moment to make that difference, to realize this legacy that Tommy Douglas has left us, fully implement universal Medicare and Pharmacare, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? Uh, questions and comments? Uh, point of order, the Honourable Member for North Island Power River.
Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. There have been discussions among the parties, and if you were to seek it, I think you would find that there is consent to adopt the following motion. That at the conclusion of today's debate on the opposition motion in the name of the member for Vancouver Kingsway, all questions necessary to dispose of the motion be deemed put and a recorded division deemed requested and deferred until Monday, March the 23rd, 2020, at the expiry of the time provided for government orders. Thank you. Does the honourable member have the unanimous content to propose a motion? Yes. The House has heard the terms of the motion. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Carried. Questions and comments? Questions et commentaires? The Honourable Member for Fleetwood Point Kells. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, there's undoubtedly passion in, in my colleague's uh, presentation, but there are some aspects, two aspects, that kind of brings out my inner Conservative. It happens. Um, one is, what would she do to preserve the contributions currently made by the private sector in some of the patchwork of programs that are being offered, uh, being uh, used by Canadians right now with private company plans. So what would we do to avoid shifting those costs directly from the private sector onto the government? And secondly, in deference to the story that she told about the person who was uh, obviously not well off and having the expense, what would, what would she propose to do with the very well off? Would she propose, for instance, to have an annual deductible on pharmacare based on basically uh, an income test? The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yes, it does sort of bring out the Conservative side of the Liberals, right? Because that is consistent with the action on many, many of the programs, not the least of which is Universal Pharmacare. I would advise the member to read the Dr. Hoskins report, because that's what I did yesterday, and it answers all of his questions. There you go. Uh, questions and comments. Central Okanagan, and Milkami Nicola. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Appreciate hearing from my uh, fellow British Columbian. Important matter. I'd just like to ask the member. She seems to be very insistent on having her and her party's way. Obviously, this is there's some constitutional issues, but I would like to simply ask the member: What happens if a province disagrees with the NDP? What uh, kind of measures does she think that the federal government needs to do to implement their vision, particularly when the provinces this is their area of jurisdiction? Honourable member for Vancouver East. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Actually, in the Hoskins report, it actually said, quote, be bold. Canadians told us, be brave. They appeal to us. But most of all, they remind us to heed before uniquely Canadian values, looking out for one another, supporting neighbours and communities through tough times, and treating each other with fairness. That is the plan forward. So for provinces, and I understand that some provinces are saying that they don't have enough resources from the federal government. Actually, I would ask the Conservative members to check themselves, because it was the Harper government who actually cut the transfer payments to provinces and territories. Had they not done that, the provinces may well come to the table and say, yes, we can do this. And for the provinces, Quebec may well want to opt out because they actually have a fairly robust program uh, in terms of farmer care there. There is that opt-out opportunity, but that said, I would also ask them to think carefully before they exercise that option, because the universal farmer care program can actually save Quebec money as well. Yes. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Madam Speaker, well, Quebecers have they are facing unacceptable drug prices, and that's why we brought in a universal pharmacare, so that no one falls through the cracks. That's clear. It's done. Let's make that clear. And that has to be respected. But here's my question. What about the price? Of drugs, even though we have a universal pharmacare program, as long as there has been no price control, the situation will continue and will get worse. And that is something the federal government could have a role to play in. Price control is federal jurisdiction. Canada is paying 19 times more than all other OECD countries.
So the government needs to act on that issue. Do, does the member agree? I would just like to point out to the member that she must address members through the Chair, please. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And that is the whole point about a universal, a national universal pharmacare program, because actually by buying bulk, you would be able to save money. And I think that too may well hook, help Quebec as well. Now, of course, help, Quebec could opt out if they wish to. And I do think that looking and negotiating and therefore have stronger negotiating power with the pharmaceuticals will make a difference in terms of the cost and the price of drugs for Quebec and across the country. And this is the power in which we can have with a national pharmacare program, Madam Speaker. Uh, you know, just to point out, the Liberals actually engage with pharmaceuticals more than 700 times in terms of talking about their needs. Perhaps it's time for the government to focus on what everyday Canadians need.